Amen. I'm just so thankful that you're here this morning. Thank you for some amazing people that I get to share this platform with each and every Sunday morning. And that we get to do ministry together as a team. And just, just all the people, man, that, that, uh, that are part of the Eastside family, man, we're so thankful. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. So we finished our series last week called I Am. And so uh, today we're going to just begin a journey. <clears throat> and it's, it's going to just be a two-week journey. I'm um, going to do what I'm referring to as kind of a mini-series. Typically my, my preaching series are, are you know, somewhere between four to five weeks. But um, I, I want to do a short two-week series that we are going to entitle Crowns. Uh, Crowns. And so it's, it's a message that... Probably, man, when I first got here, I was intrigued as I was studying Scripture, but I really never formulated it. I had mentioned that, that, that there's crowns in the Bible and crowns in Scripture and, and that, that I want to talk to. And some of you all came up to me and was like, man, that, this, that, that sounds really cool and really exciting, and, and I would like to hear more. And So it just wasn't until this week that you know, God said, hey, it's time to preach that. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk about um, this sermon series of crowns, and we're going to talk about it in two phases, if you will. Today, we're going to talk about the, the, the judgment phase, and then next week, we're going to talk about the reward phase, because there is a place in Scripture um, called the judgment seat of Christ that is where these rewards are going to happen. And, and, and until you understand the judgment phase and what that means, um, you won't understand next week the reward phase. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 um, is going to be kind of our jumping off point. So, so keep your, <clears throat> uh, your finger there if you don't mind. But as I was reading the scriptures, in the closing chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus, he gave us a clear statement regarding an event that would follow immediately the rapture or the carrying away of the church. And in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, I want to read this. You can turn there if you want, but you don't have to. The, John the Revelator writes these words, And this is what he said, meaning Jesus, Behold, I come quickly. He's coming. Do you believe that? Jesus is coming soon. I can't give you a date. I can't give you an approximation. But I just want to tell you that Jesus is coming. And He might be coming for all the world or He might be coming for one of us. That's a sobering statement, isn't it? Behold, I come quickly. And He says, and my reward. Jesus says, and my reward is with me to give to every man according to His work that shall be. So what I want you to understand is that, number one, Jesus is coming. Number two, that Jesus has with him rewards. Do you see that there in Revelation? And that these rewards that Jesus is carrying with him when he comes back a second time, because we've, he's already had his first coming, but he's coming back for his second coming, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to give to us rewards according to our works. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming suddenly. There's a condition. You cannot get the rewards until he comes. Do you see that? And, and, and then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, you should be there. For we must uh, all appear, and, and I'm just going to teach this morning. I'm going to teach today because I'm excited about this, this. I was unwrapping and unpacking. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The Apostle Paul used that word to the church at Corinthian. He said, there is a judgment seat of Christ. And it's at that judgment seat of Christ, each of us may receive what is due. Another translation says, each of us must receive the reward for us. According to the things done while in the body, good or bad. So here it is. Revelation. Jesus says, I come quickly. And I'm coming and I have a reward. And I want to distribute those rewards as how people have worked in this life. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says what? That each of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before the judgment seat, so that they can receive what is due them 
Again, for the things done while in a body. Here's my big idea this morning. Very simple, big idea. Every person, whether they're saved or whether they are unsaved, will face judgment before God one day. See, we get this thing wrong in the church. And see, I've been, I'm 42 years old. I've been in the church all my life. And I haven't heard messages like this in the church. Because when we preach judgment, it's, oh, you're going to hell. No, that's not the, the type of judgment that I'm talking about today. That's not what I'm talking about. So, so some of y'all, when I said we're going to talk about judgment, you immediately turn, turned off and said, I don't want to hear that. No, that's not. This is a good thing. Today we're talking about judgment, which is a good thing. But watch this. We, and we also think that just the sinners are going to be judged. That's not scriptural. Because, yes, it is scriptural, the fact that, that God will judge the sinners. We're going to talk about that. But there's also going to be a judgment for believers. So that's why I said the big idea this morning is every person, whether they're saved or whether they're unsaved, will stand before an almighty God and will face the perfect person of Jesus Christ face to face. That's why the Apostle Paul in other, says, in other places says, says th these words, that, that right now we see through a fogged up mirror. You know that text? And he says, but soon you will see face to face. In other words, the thing that is foggy will eventually be cleared up. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited today. To, to preach this. And that's why I came back to the church last night at 9.30 and I was here till almost midnight just, just, just combing scriptures and praying and walk in, the, walk in the building. There was only one light that was on in this, in, this, in, this, in this church and that was my office light. And I was walking around the building and it was dark. See, I've been here long enough. I can walk around the building in the dark and not run into anything unless one of y'all puts something in the way and I don't know. But I was excited because this is a message for the church. And this is the message, for the, I believe, for the hour that, that we're talking about, that every person, whether saved or unsaved. One of my favorite ministers to listen to is Pastor Adrian Rogers, and, and he was pastor in, in, I believe it was Memphis, Tennessee, Bellevue Baptist Church, and, and he's gone on to be with the Lord. He's received his eternal reward. But Adrian Rogers said this, not one mother's child will be the exception to Judgment Day. For we must all appear before the Lord. And, and let me just tell you, it won't matter what church you went to. It won't matter if you were a one-hand worshiper or a two-hand worshiper. It won't matter who your parents were, who your grandparents were. It, it won't matter uh, 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 what you think about end times theology. It don't matter what you think about spiritual gifts. But what matters is one day we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and we will all appear before the Lord for a review, if you will, Unto the Lord. So this morning, I, I, have, I have two points. That's it. I'm going to preach a while, though. All right? What's the big deal about judgments? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. Thank you very much for your consideration. What's the big deal about judgments? Number one, there are several judgments <clears throat> that will take place. And we're going to talk about that. And you've got to understand church history. You've got to understand the biblical text. Because in the biblical text, we have something called the Old Covenant, and then we have something called the New Covenant. And see, we got to understand that there's a balance between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. we got some people saying, well, I'm just an Old Testament believer. And then we got some people saying, well, I'm just a New Testament only believer. No, can I tell you that this pastor, this boy, he's in all the Testament believers. Because you're not going to understand and, and, and partake of the New Testament if you don't understand the Old Testament. You don't have to, you got to understand that the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the things that were to come in the New Testament. That everything that happened, all the, all the miracles and all the, all the metaphors and, and all the things that happened in the Old Testament was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. But you have to understand that in the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant from, from, from Genesis to Malachi is based on one simple word. And that simple word is a three-letter word called the word law. That, that's why Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are called the what? The Mosaic Law. The law of, of who? The law of Moses. And, and see, we New Testament believers just want to throw out the law. And then those that are just in Old Testament want to live only law. But they don't understand when Jesus came, Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. It works together. And in, in the Old Covenant, we have judgments. 
The first judgment happened in the garden. Because Adam and Eve did something that they weren't supposed to do. God, God put them in the garden and said, you shall have, you can partake of anything in this garden, but don't touch this one thing. And that's just like us, the one thing that we're not supposed to have, we want. So if there's one thing in your life that you're going after, you got to make sure it's not the one thing you want, but the one thing God wants. Too many churches and too many pastors are going after the one thing that they want and, and not going after. A year ago, I had an epiphany. And here's the epiphany. I've been getting together with some pastors, and we've been searching scripture together, and, we, and we've, been, we've been praying together and, and, and doing, doing all this through some, some, some Zoom video chat. and stuff. But, but we, we came to the conclusion as pastors. We said, you know what? It's not our church. It's the Lord's church. And, and, and it's a little pressure, and I still receive, feel some pressure sometimes as a pastor, but it's not my pressure to fill the seats. It's not my pressure to, to, to beg you to give more money. It's God's church. My job is to be the delivery boy for the, for the gospel of Jesus Christ and to preach it out. And, and so when things go wrong, it's not my church, God, it's yours. God, you take it. And I'm still working through that. You can pray for me about that. Because my OCD, my control personality, is, is, is kind of difficult. But, but, but we have this, oh, they, they violated God's command. And then, later on, we have another Old Testament, uh, old, old Covenant, if you will. Because people were living in rampant, rampant sin. And God was sorry that, that, he, that, that He created this world. And He told Noah, and He said, I'm going to send a flood. And he destroyed it all. That's the judgment of God. Amen. Isn't it? And then he said, well, I, I, I repented that I even made man. And then he said, well, I'm not going to do that again. He sent the rainbow, and this is my promise. But that doesn't mean that all judgments are foregone. And then in Genesis chapter 11, we have people that, 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 that tried to build a tower to God, the Tower of Babel. See, we refer to it as the Tower of Babel, but it's not. It's the Tower of Babel. Why? Because they were in one language. And they tried on their own to do and be God. And then God confounded, and that's why we have all the different languages. That was the judgment of God. And then we have Egypt and the judgment of Egypt and their gods, the ten plagues, uh, so on and so forth. But then here's what happened. The old covenant was a type of the law and was the law. But the new covenant, we entered into a new covenant and we no longer are walking in the, in, the, in, the, in the period of the law. But now, we as believers are walking through the period of, the, of, of grace. Because Jesus said, for all the law was given through Moses. John, I'm quoting John 1, 17. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we have this, this, this teeter-totter, if you will, of, of law and grace. And there's a lot of people that want to just live and carry out law. See, the law is good for us, though. Would you, would you affirm that? The law is good for us because it gives us the boundaries, if you will. But we in the church have done a terrible job of helping people with those boundaries because we've shamed them and we've guilted them to try to stay within the confines of those boundaries. Are you with me? But grace says... And, 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 and here is the, the, the difference between law and grace, that, that Jesus came and he said, watch this, I want you to stay within the boundaries because I know that sin can hurt you. And I know how damaging sin is. And so when I entered, I came in because I brought grace. And, and what I want to do is, is I want to pick you up and instead of beating you into submission... And beating you back into the boundary marker, what I want to do is I want to gently lift you up and I want to place you back within the boundaries. It's, it's like, like when we have animals. We don't want to kick the animals back into the cage. Maybe you do, I don't know. But that's not very good. But we don't kick the animals back into the cage. What do we want to do? We want to gently say, get back into your resting place. Are you with me? And, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the, the tricky part of operating in, in law versus grace. And too many churches have operated 
we, we've been out of balance in the church. We've been too much law, and that's not good. And then I'm a balanced preacher. Then we've also been too much grace and just let everybody do whatever they want to, which has been damning for their soul. And we haven't want to, want to, want to give them truth. Friends, you can't just let your kids, if you've got little kids, you just can't, and i got little kids, you just can't, and a big kid too, i got, I got them all, but, but you just can't let them run out in the middle of the street and do whatever they want to. And have, and this is what we do in the church, and just have faith that, no, that, that a car is not going to hit them. There's a, such a thing called stupid faith. Right? I'm just being honest. So we as parents are to give our kids boundaries because we are responsible for them. Well, God also does the same thing. He gives his kids boundaries. Because at the end of eternity, he loves us and he's responsible for us. Are you with me? Does, does that make sense this morning? And there are several, several judgments. And so I shared some old covenant, but I want to go to the uh, kind of the mix of new and old. But I want to go through some things and then we're going to land on one of them. But, but there's seven judgments that I was studying about. And, and these won't all be long. I'm not going to preach very long on, on each one of these. But the first judgment has already happened. In, in the New Testament age, if you will, it was prophesied about in Isaiah chapter 53, and it was carried out um, over 2,000 years ago in, in the year of 30 A.D., the first judgment. And, and I didn't give you a place to write these down, but, it, but if you have extra notes, it might be good, or an extra time, place to write some stuff down, it might be good to write these things down. The first judgment is the judgment of sin. It's recorded in the four Gospels. It happened already in 30 A.D. It happened on Calvary's cross. It was the judgment of sin, um, Jesus, who, 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 who knew no sin, became sin for us. And God judged sin on the cross. Amen. And see, what we got to understand, and, and I've said it before, I think I said it on a Wednesday night, is that, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, while it was for sin, it just wasn't for sin only. It was to arrest death and to kill death once and for all. So it was the judgment of sin. It was the judgment of death. That's why when Jesus um, came out of the grave, he says, I have the keys of death. He told Peter, hell and I have the keys of the grave. God judged sin fully, and that was the judgment of sin. And then I, you can read about that, Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 8. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, despised and rejected. He's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our sins was upon him, and by the stripes of Jesus we are healed. Spiritually, physically, and emotionally. Amen? The second judgment is the, not just the judgment of sin, but the judgment of self-evaluation. And this is what we need to be doing now, daily. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 31 says, If we judge ourselves, we shall not what? Be judged. He's talking to the Corinthian church. If we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Who won't we be judged by? We're not going to be judged by God. Because we have to keep a daily record. See, see, this is why some pastors say, is your salvation experience up to date? This is called walking on the highway of holiness. This is called the church of God term, sanctification. A daily setting yourself apart. And it's not just a church of God term, it's a Bible term. Daily setting yourself apart, making sure your salvation experience is up to date. That we need to practice self-examination prayerfully and honestly and assess where we are in our own spiritual condition before the Lord. It goes on time and time throughout the church age. We are in the church age right now. Throughout the age of the believer's life. And here's the place. The place is here on the earth right now. Are you, are you with me? Does that make sense? We need to do that. We need to evaluate the pattern of our life. Not the issues of, of, of your husband. Not the issues of your wife. But you need to evaluate your own issues. See, see, see one of the greatest things that we can do is, is, is not tell our, our spouse or whoever... How, how, how terrible they are. If you want them to be leveled up and if you want them to be raised up, why don't you start praying for them? Because you'll find out if you start praying for them, and, and this is, this is just, just, just truth. We're talking more about that in, in, in a series that we're going to start on Mother's Day that's going to lead us to Father's Day called Building the Family. We're going to talk about that. It's going to be a, be a long series. We're going to deal with, deal with their husbands and wives and, and, and kids and grand, grandparents and, and all this stuff. We're going to deal with I think it's eight weeks, so, so we're going to deal with that, six or eight weeks. Um, and, um, but, but here's the thing. Well, let me, let me put it to you this way. If you want a better preacher, 
pray for this one. Don't pray for another one to come in here. I'm, I'm, I'm just being real. Well, if we just had another preacher, that's damaged the church. Just pray for the one you got. Because then when you pray, you take vested interest. And when you walk through the doors, you're like, God, I can't wait to receive. Does that, you hear what I'm saying? So do the same thing in your families. Do the same thing with people, you know, those relationships. And it's not, self -evalu it's not self evaluation of somebody else, but it's self evaluation of yourself. And then what you're going to find is that you're going to be more, it's, that person didn't change. Yeah, you changed. And you became more loving. And you became more compassionate. Are you with me? This is good, amen? amen. The third type of judgment, and, and we're going to land on this one, and we're going to stay here. We're going to come back to this here in just a minute, because this is what this morning is all about. But the third type of judgment is the judgment of believers' works. Judgment we're going to talk about today, the judgment of believers' works is going to take place after the, Jesus comes back and, and takes his church away. We're going to come back to that. The fourth judgment in the Bible is the judgment of Israel, and you can read about that in Ezekiel chapter number 20, verses 33 to 34. When Christ returns, it says at that point he's going to judge Israel. It says he will purge out from Israel, what? The rebels. And he will take those that are left who believed into his kingdom. And these judgments have a specific time and a specific place. You can read more about that in Ezekiel. The fifth judgment is the judgment of the Gentiles. This is the judgment of the nations. And Jesus talks about that when he's on the Mount of Olives. He gives this Olivet di Discourse, and it's a discourse about the sheep and the goats. You remember that one? And, and he says, those, watch this, and this is why. You, you, you wonder, and you, and you try to understand why Israel keeps being in the news. It's because Israel is a, is a crucial part of biblical history. And Israel is a, is a very important timeline event in biblical events and you got to understand that and because when Jesus was talking about the sheeps and the goats he wasn't talking about literal sheeps and goats what Jesus and, and you got to see this what Jesus was really talking about is he says those who showed faith in God by treating Israel favorably giving them comfort and aid after Jesus comes back they're the sheep that's going to enter into the kingdom of God but those who followed after the spirit of the Antichrist those that lead the persecution is Israel. They are the goats that will be consigned forever to hell. Are you with me? The judgment of the Gentiles. But, but then number six, this is kind of cool. The next one is the judgment of the angels. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? That's when we rule and reign with, with Jesus. And if the world is not as judged by you... Are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining into this life? And Jude chapter 1 verse 6 says, actually, it's, it's the only chapter. It's really not a chapter, just Jude 1, 6. says, or just Jude 6, says, And those angels which kept not their first estate. So those are the angels that we're going to be judging, the demons. I believe it's the fallen angels that we're going to be judging. That's just me. I believe that. But there's angels facing the judgment. Be the fallen angels. They're, they're Satan's hordes of demons. And they're going to be judged by the redeemed ones of the Lamb. Aren't you so glad about that? And then the seventh judgment. This is the final one. The great white throne room judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11 through 15 says, I saw a great white throne. And to him who he was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. And then he says, watch this, and the books were open. Did you know that there's, there's a library in heaven? Did you know that? See, we just in church want to talk about, about, about the Lamb's book of life. Well, there's, you got to read to go to heaven. Amen, praise God. Read your word. He said the books were open. I don't know about you, is this exciting to you? I, this is fun, man. This is, this is fun preaching. So we were like, man, you preach. 
uh, uh, people, biblical prophecy, scary. No, man, biblical. It's exciting to unwrap the pages of the Word of God and to talk about what is happening and what's going to happen because one day we're going to be with Him. And one day, not only are we going to be with Him, but we're going to be like Him and we shall see Him as He is. I said I was just going to teach today. He said, he said, I saw the books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. There it is. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged. Each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire. She was thrown into the lake of fire. The final judgment of unbelievers for their sins occurs at the end of times. Before the creation of the new heaven. Before the creation of the new earth. At, the, at this judgment, unbelievers from all ages are judged for their sins and consigned to the lake of fire. What powerful, but what a humbling, and what a fearful picture that we get so these are the judgments the seven judgments that are experienced and that will happen that have happened that that will happen and if you don't understand the judgments again i want to come back to this pendulum if you don't understand the judgments you won't really appreciate the rewards so let me give you number two number two just because we are saved I assume most of you are saved. Hope so. If you're not saved, you can be. And if you're not saved, you can be. And you need to fall into this category. This is an exciting category. Just because we're saved, judgment then is not behind us. It's not just about getting your foot over the thresholds of heaven's door and everything's good. There's more. See, see what we got to understand is that there is so much more that God has for each one of you. It's just not fire insurance, friends. It's just not monopoly, get out of jail free card, you know? There's not a corner of, of, of Heaven's Boulevard that says you've passed go, collect $200. Are you with me this morning? I hope this is encouraging to you because it just encouraged me, it lights me up. I just get excited about this. It's like, man, one of those. But we, just because we're saved, it's not about just getting to heaven and being so glad about it. There's so much more to this life. And friends, there's so much more to heaven than we're going to know right now. Here's the exciting thing about heaven. And I know we got the description of, uh, descriptions of heaven in, in the book of Revelation, so on and so forth. But can I just tell you that heaven's going to be so much more than you and I think. And you and I know. And see, see we do. Man, 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 church people spend too much time arguing about the end times and how it's going to happen and, and, and when it's going to happen and, and what's heaven going to be like and stuff like that. Man, we, we just need to get about the business of trying to take as many people to heaven as we can with us. I mean, it's okay to have conversations and things like that. Can I, can I just tell you that, that as a pastor, I've been in the church, I'm still wrestling with how all this stuff's going to take place. I'm still wrestling with it because you know what? When God says, if you can figure it out, then that, that, that leaves it up to me. He wants us to be aware. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the things. Don't be ignorant. But, but here's the thing that you don't need to be ignorant about, is that he's coming back. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready when he comes. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready when he comes. So believers, just because we're saved. And again, our scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Who's the people? Who's going to be there? For we... That's all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Who's, who's the Apostle Paul talking about? Or First of all, who, who's Paul talking to? Do your inductive Bible study. He's, he's writing to the church at Corinth. These are Christian believers. Granted, they did not have everything all together. They were like messed up. But yet, he's still talking to the church at Corinth. They are a church, they are believers that assembled together, and they were worshiping God in that place. So Paul is talking, who's the we that Paul's talking about? He's talking about Christians. For we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For Christians will all appear. It's not you die and it's over. No, you die and you see Jesus and there's a judgment. 
And this is good kind. Well, it could be. Paul's a Christian talking to Christians. He says, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, by the way, he's talking about their physical bodies. Because the Bible also says in other places that you are the tabernacle, right? You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and this house, you're a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Can an unbeliever say that? If a Paul is talking about us being tabernacles made with heavenly hands, unbelievers can't say that. So it, 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 you ha- he has to be talking about believers. I believe that. So let me, let me give you these subpoints, and we're, we're going we're to wind it down. But I, I want you to be encouraged today. And then next week we're going to talk a little bit about the crowns. But the Bema, because the judgment seat is the, the, the Greek word. When we read the judgment seat there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it's, it's the Greek word judgment seat, or, or replace judgment with, with, the, with the actual word, the literal translation, is, is called Bema, B-E-M-A. The Bema, the Bema is the believer's judgment. The Bema seat judgment does not determine salvation. Rather, it's when believers must give an account of God or two of their lives to Christ. Again, don't confuse the judgment seat with the great white throne judgment. And see, I was always raised in the church that when we go to, to, to when we die, that we're not going to say anything. That's not true. First of all, he's going to say, he is going to say, enter in or depart. He's going to say that. We're not going to have an opportunity at that moment to say anything. But then when we become face to face with God, he says, you have to give an account. When you go before the accountant, what do you do? You give an account of all your finances. One by one, line by line, you explain it to them. They look at it, and you're looking. They, come, they ask you a question. Well, why'd you deduct all this? Because I was trying to get ahead. And then you say, i got to repent. But he says, each one of you, this should blow your mind, has to give an account. Has to give an account. And, and I find it very interesting also, in other parts in, in, uh, uh, of Scripture, we talk about this accounting, but, but when you understand the Bema seat in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, it, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, appeared before the judgment seat of Gal- uh, Galileo, the, the proconsul of Achaia, which is in Corinth, and he appeared before the Bema. But that was a court system appearance. But then, in the Greek context, you've got to understand the Greek games which was held together in the Greek and civilized world. But in the Greek games, or where we get our modern-day Olympic games, there was called a Bema seat. And that Bema seat was an elevated platform at the end of the race. And what happened there, and this is exciting, is at the end of the race, when, when the judge would make sure that everybody ran the race and they didn't cheat... The Bema judge, or the one that sat in the Bema seat, was on this elevated platform. So they used to do it backwards back then. And would stand on the elevated platforms. And for the winners of the event, the Bema judge would hand out awards. Who came in first? Who came in second? And who came in third? Now this is going to be really exciting. But it wasn't awards like we think in our modern day. See, in a modern day Olympics, what do they do? They put the winners on the platform. And somebody's, you know, not on the platform. And they bend over like this, don't, don't they? And they put around their neck a medal. But back in Greek times, in Greek games, the context of this is written, the awarder of the awards stood on the platform. The winners gave the account, I win, (laughs) I'm first, I'm second, I'm third. Just wait for it. And the Bama judge would place a, not just a reward, but he would place a crown 
or a wreath on the winner's head. <laughs> and one day, we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of our lives. And watch this, my last point this morning. The crowns are rewards at the judgment seat because the accounts of our lives will be reviewed. How we treat others, how we exercise authority of others, how we use our God-given abilities. And so every word, every thought, every deed, every jot, every tittle, how we relate to people, how we relate to God, we are given an account. But then, praise God, John chapter 3, verse 16, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10, is we should not focus on the Bema seat as Christ judging our sins but rather as God rewarding us according to our lives. Because the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Are you seeking the Lord? And see, some people, we, we have a, a joke in our family that said, man, that guy's going to get more crowns. He's going to get more crowns. And some said, man, they got their crown ripped off today. But the crowns are awarded at the judgment seat based on the account that we give. Because God is the dispenser of gifts shown to, by the faithfulness that we've exhibited in our lives. God is the constant companion. He's the bridegroom. He's coming back for his church. He's the rewarder. And it's all happening at the time and the place that God so desires and God so chooses. This morning as you stand.